Oh. Here we go. There it is. Hold on, hold on. We have to stop. We have to start over. I actually had half my shit muted and I didn't even realize it. Uh, so, forget uh, it. Cancel. You know Redo. what? Show, show is starting over. Everyone, wait for me to restream in just a second. Just kidding. Let's go. <laughs> Where we're going, we don't need oil. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, it ended. It ended with a. Ree! Yeah, that's that's how I end stuff now. Um, also, uh, Cosmo is like completely stripped right now, so that was that was actually semi-modular modular, modular uh, devices over here, mostly. But yeah. oh wow! So none of that none of that was to Cosmo. None of that was the Cosmo. Um, wow. I didn't have time. I had to do some stuff last minute after I, I like tore it all down intending to make a patch. And then I was like, you know, while well, it's all torn down, I'll completely rewire my patch bay, which takes like an hour. Um, what am I doing? Let's change the camera angle. Uh, we, I'll change the <laughs> Did we do introductions on this show or not? I forget. Yeah, I don't know. Hey, I'm Hex7. Welcome to What the Heck. This is Robbie. Uh, yeah, this week we're, I guess, going to talk about... Um, unpatching things i don't know <laughs> you know I, it's this is a great topic because i recently rearranged my case too so we can dig into that i'd love to i'd love to explore how why you did it and and how you did it and your your rationale for it like like you, your your criteria for evaluating if you've arranged it correctly or not okay yeah so uh Am I, am I too loud? I don't know. Anyway. No, you uh, sound great. Okay. I'm going to change the camera angle to the bad Cosmo angle. Um, I don't think anyone could see anything on it, but uh, I can at least point to stuff. Um, so, I mean, the first thing I do is strip it all down. Uh, the plan is to, I'm going to probably pop out the mass uh, and maybe the rample too. We shall see. Um, in preparation for this case, I'm going to build very shortly once I get the parts. Um, but one of the things I do want to do is actually swap out the Gur filter because I'm actually not using it that that much with this voice. Um, so I'll probably put that in another case and I'll put something else that I'll, I'll actually use because it, it mostly just passing through it at this point. Um, but I basically evaluate what I keep based on what I use. So uh, there's a pretty rad glide here and a glide up here. And I really only ever use the base one regularly, so I think I could probably pop this one out and add another um, attack release envelope generator that I have about this size. Because uh, I do, um, or there's the glide, I do actually use this uh, envelope generator quite often. I feel like I, I'm like one short regularly, uh, so I'm just like using gate signals as as a 
for, through just straight to the v, VCA because I don't have any more envelopes. I've done that before because I have I have four uh, attack decay envelopes, uh, attack decay envelope generators, and I'm going to be honest. I wish I had six or eight, maybe, because it turns out they're super useful to do interesting stuff with. Like, they're they say you can't have too many VCAs, but like in modern times with modules that have a lot of attenuverters built in, you can never have too many envelope generators. <laughs> I, yeah, I agree. And and I mean, I do have mass and I could use mass as an envelope generator, but usually I'm using it for like worse things. Like uh, I was telling uh, Benjamin Izzo that uh, <laughs> very recently I was using it because I, I had the, I have the, uh, laser theremin. So I wanted to put the laser theremin in similar to what we did where I was using it. We were using like a, uh, something to gate it and an envelope generate, like make it pulse to the beat. Right. And mm -hmm. the easiest way to do that for me wasn't running straight clock signal. Cause that, that very, was very stuttery. I wanted like a little bit of an envelope, um, which I didn't achieve, but, but what I did do is run the clock into this clock generator up here, which is an analog one. Uh, and this one actually has a resize mode, which is pretty rad. Uh, where a, like, a resize I, mode? You said? Yeah. So I've got the clock on now. So I don't know if you can see. Uh, let me look at the camera. Uh, yeah. So you can see the flashing lights. I'm going to slow it down in just a sec. So you see how they're flashing right here? Yes. Um, if I turn resize off, they should be exactly 50-50, right? But if I turn resize on and I start adjusting it, you'll see it start swinging one direction or the other, right? Oh, so resize adjusts the, just looks for like a rising edge. It doesn't matter how, how wide the clock pulse width is. Is right. that what resize does? Right, right. So it's essentially changing the pulse width, so making it shorter or wider, um, because this actually has two outs, one on the uh, on and one on the off, uh, which is kind of confusing to say. But the trick is running both of these into a mass and combining them into one uh, basically set of clock triggers. Um, so I ran my clock in here so that instead of this one, it was like triggering this button basically and resizing it. So I could add really nice swing to it if I wanted to, but that was what I was using as a clock divider. Um, yeah, I was going to say, speed. Be because it has a clock, because it, it the clock width affects when, when the, the rise and the fall or whatever, yeah. um, you can create like interesting swinging effects with that. That's really, really cool. That is an interesting way to create a... I remember talking to somebody about how there's a million ways to create a swing effect, and like you could you could literally have a clock thing that has swing built in, like Pam's, or you could put delay on your triggers or your delay on your audio, which Pam's Pam's can do delay on your triggers, or yeah, but you can do, do delay on your audio and make it sound swung. Or that's another yet another way to do a swing effect, and that's awesome. And that was just because I didn't have a, a clock divider handy. Um, so that was that was a fun thing. So I use just about everything in here. So I'll swap out a handful of things. Um, but I think I'm gonna I'm gonna have to do some thinking to figure out what I want to do with this panel. I might actually um, do more effects type things in there. So filters, data bender type stuff, your reverb or something. Um, but as far the most of the work I spent the time doing <laughs> today was was redoing the patch bay over over there um, and what I had done was I had pulled the <laughs> a bunch of uh, basically cables going into there from stereo sources and then into that secondary stereo mixer and then back into here uh, so I can uh, like nor like do crazy things like normal them to double the signal and stuff like that but uh, I just wasn't using them so uh, I turned that into just just for the show <laughs> that's all I use that mixer for at this point uh, so I can hear you and my music without switching headphones. Uh, technology sucks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I ended up pulling a, actually a ton of cables out of there that weren't being used and um, re-ran the two stereo things that I really I use. Um, I ran the uh, Bit Ranger, which you... Ooh, hold on, let me... Uh, yeah, what is that? This is the Bit Ranger. good like a atari sounds yeah so it's it's completely unfiltered cool uh bastel instrument uh there synthesizer 
Um, and it's got all sorts of cool stuff. Like a, this is a little add-on thing that just a grid that connects patch cables for you. Like you'll connect one side to ends and others out, and you get some happy accidents that way. And this is a soft pop. That's where some more of the sound was coming from. Yeah, that was that weird sound. Let me ask, what, where was that? Yeah. What was making that pretty, almost a string sound? This sound. Yeah, that. What is that? That is the that is actually not a modular. This is the Korg XD, um, and that's a patch that I made. Uh, oh, it's beautiful. Uh, oh yeah, listen to that. Oh, sweep that filter, baby. Even like the, I kind of like that you can make your own um, like little sequences that are attached to a patch. Uh, so like this one, kind of a fun one. Anyway. I like that patch, so I use it every once in a while. I, I notice that, like, on the one hand, using a like a, a keyboard or a non-modular synthesizer is like easy mode, but I can't deny that you get really good results out of it. Sometimes, I mean, there, sometimes it's really nice to have an, an instrument that folks have spent a very long time thinking about, like the signal chain, like the you get really good results out of the XD. Um, that's a synthesizer that probably won't leave uh, me unless I have to sell it for some reason. <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I love the sound of it. Um, the SEO2, also a really rad, super bassy, but I, after Cosmo, I hardly ever touch that thing unless I'm like out of voices or something. So that one's uh, probably going to go. <laughs> and you'll notice uh, if you look at this camera angle, my my here I'll go get uh, I can't reach it <laughs> I'm, I just, I've got a leash on my head uh, the keyboard that was here is no longer here because uh, I want to try using the micro freak to control everything because it could actually it actually has a really nice mode in it uh, to detach the keyboard essentially and send the the MIDI out on a different channel that it's receiving um, so I can actually send MIDI to the pyramid and then on the pyramid I just I decide where that's controlling so I can actually make it control itself or like make it control the XD. Oh. So like, I'm thinking of using that as a primary keyboard. I just there's some kinks I got to work out because I just made that change. So that was another thing. Like I'm trying to figure out a better use of space. Like what do I really need? Um, yeah. Hmm. Based on what I'm using, and I I mean it's just based on use. Like if I don't <laughs> if I don't find myself using like the sub oscillator module on all of my voices, maybe I don't need two of them. Um, that kind of thing. You know, that's the hardest thing, I think, is it, it's kind of like it's, it, some people have this problem with clothing because they'll look at their clothes and they'll go, I don't want to throw away that shirt. It's perfectly fine. And it's like, yeah, it may be perfectly fine, but you haven't worn it in two years. You're not going to miss it. Like, make room for something else. And I think it's kind of the same thing with a modular – with a module, you're like – I, I love this module. It's great, but I haven't. I never use it in any patch. It's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with the module. I just don't use it. So get it out of there and make room for something that you will use. That, that's hard to do. Yeah, I mean, with modular, well, with the synthesizer stuff, I find it's like pretty easy for me to do because I can pull it, put it on a shelf put something else in there. And if I find myself missing it, like I've done this with uh, <laughs> envelope generators. I've actually pulled some and I'm like, I don't need that many. Uh, and like a week later, I was like, ah, I'm putting you right back. Sorry, whatever was in there before, <laughs> I need the envelopes. Uh, yeah. So like, I, I think that's a good like gauge. Like if I haven't, if it's gathered dust for two months, it's it's now on the to sell list probably, so. Uh, I, um, it's like super rare or you made it or something. I don't know. I, I did the same thing where I pulled out. I, I just recently, like a couple months ago, got a Bitbox Micro. Um, and it's a sampler, right? It plays samples. It's great. I, I think it's a great sampler module. I think it, it's really good because it's designed around not just triggering samples, but using CV to control a filter or control the pitch or control the level or do all kinds of cool stuff with CV and to trigger the samples. But you know what? I I found myself not enjoying using it, even though I got good <laughs> sounds out of it. So I, I took it out. It's in my... I, I have it here. I can put it back in if I really, really want it. But I put back in um, some other modules so that I could make good percussion sounds. And I'm much happier it, 
in my more limited setup and it's a strange thing to to come to terms with i mean that's that was almost word for word my story with morphogene although i think i complained about it more than you complained about the bitbox <laughs> um but like it's a module that just makes the most amazing sounds i just um I think the hard part for me on that module, and I, I don't know if it's the same with the Bitbox, but like it just took so much sort of setup to get to that sweet spot, uh, and I didn't enjoy that. And I, you know. Hey, um, hey, so so Forestine has a question, and there's yeah. a couple questions actually. The first yeah. one is about uh, using using the Micro Freak as yes. your primary keyboard. There's there's touch velocity and interesting because it's not a physical keyboard. It's just a circuit board that you touch your fingers to. And then the yes. second question is um, using that to send to different parameters using through Pyramid or through MIDI or whatever. Yeah, so it's, it's actually a pretty super cool controlled device. And uh, I haven't used it in this detached mode yet. So this, this might, I might have to rearrange things back to sort of where they were. Uh, which thankfully isn't too much trouble, but um, as far as the keyboard goes, like I'll answer that first question. It is my favorite keyboard, um, period. Uh, like I do enjoy regular keyboards too, but this one, like, it's just a blast to play, at least with the Micro Freak, because you have that multi-touch, after-touch. It's not like the same by any means as after-touch on uh, any, any of the other keyboards where you have a little more control because you can sort of adjust your pressure this is a little more wild and i think part of that is that i'm in like the driest high altitude place where like maybe my <laughs> fingers don't work good uh, <laughs> but if they made like an 88 key like mega freak i will 100 percent buy it like straight up like i i know the keyboard will eventually wear out wear out but oh well like i, I can buy a, i don't know swap out the circuit board because it's just a circuit board um like yeah, I, I think it's awesome. It's it's by far my favorite keyboard. Um, and some of the other control things that like you you could still like um, do like pitch bends and things. But right now uh, I just like seriously made this swap. So uh, I haven't worked out all the kinks right now. The aftertouch is not sending even though it's supposed to be. And I don't know if it's that or pyramid or where in the chain. So I have to do some testing and debugging first. But um, I'm hoping that I can get to that sweet spot where I can use the aftertouch for anything. So, I mean, it won't like, like none of the, none of the synthesizers I have, like other than the Micro Freak have poly aftertouch. So it'll just take whatever the, the highest value is from, from the aftertouch. Well, the other thing I wanted to say about it wearing out eventually is that I, I think the Micro Freak is probably less likely to wear out than a one where the keys actually have travel because those have mechanical things that can wear out. Yeah. So that's, uh, I think you're probably right, but I've seen a few cases like on the forums and things where people are complaining because you only ever see complaints on forums. <laughs> yeah. uh, where like the keyboard, like the, the actual circuit, like the printed circuit, uh, the, the copper traces have like worn off. Oh. Uh, so I think that is probably the highest risk right there uh, of it wearing out. And I don't, I mean, I don't see any anything even close to that right now. So um if it wears out, fine. I think it is the <laughs> it is super duper value. Like they just they even just released an update for it that adds more like sounds and wavetables. You can cust add custom wavetables. I, I saw that they just added custom wavetables, and I was excited when they released the noise engineering um, update, where they basically put a bunch of noise engineering modules in the Micro Freak, um, and now there's like custom wavetables. That's like a brand that that just happened today, I think, or maybe yeah. yesterday. It was, I don't remember, but um, I think it might have been yesterday. I, I don't know. But yeah, it was just happened. I haven't updated because um, I've had other things to do. But the noise engineering update was sick. Can confirm. Uh, I haven't actually like added some of their presets. Like on, on my Micro Freak, I was pretty proud that I deleted all the presets and made my own. But like <laughs> uh, the noise engineering ones are sick. So, you know, what are you going to do? Um, but another question that's kind of cool with it is it's got this patch matrix up here, similar to like, uh, I don't know, uh, like a Cynthia or something, but it's uh, digital. Uh, and these last three buttons I can set to be whatever I want. Um, so if I like touch a knob, like I touch a button and then twist a knob a little bit, all of a sudden whatever is on this left side will control the vertical column. So like I can control like any of these controls with like an LFO. 
but I can also set that to CV. So it can take CV in and out. So mm -hmm. I can uh, it can accept CV uh, to control whatever or or send it out. So um, th it's pretty awesome. Like, uh, yeah. Let's see what else did the chat say. Keyboards can be t yeah. Keyboards can be rebuilt. Like I'm not. Uh, <laughs> that's true. Like, I, don't, I don't think that's a problem in most cases, unless it's a huge that's expensive true. keyboard. Um, I very yeah. rarely use. I ha I do have a micro brute, um, but I very rarely use it. And uh, when I do use it, I typically only use the CV out. I don't actually do anything with it, and even that is very very infrequent. Yeah, that that sounds like a device that could go on your hit list unless you just enjoy playing with it in isolation. Like that's, I mean, it's a it's a cool synth, but like you almost have built your own Robbie version. Yeah, I might. To be honest, I'm I'm consider if I was going if I needed to clean it up and I wanted to make the most of what I have, I would probably get rid of it and replace it with that new. Didn't didn't Arturia release a a, a smaller? Um, uh, key step. They made like a key step mini or something like that. I think it had a number in the title. Yes, but I don't remember what it's called. It's like a little colorful, beautiful little key step. And honestly, the key step is my second favorite keyboard. So can't go wrong yeah. with the key step. Anyway. So that's what I. If I wanted to do keyboards, that's that might be what I would do. But I don't want to do keyboards. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I. Here's the thing. I, I largely use the keyboard. Like sometimes I'm playing it, like if there's pads or something, but I typically use it for programming more than anything because for whatever reason, like this grid of like this, I just have a hard time parsing mentally. So like I'm not even showing you the grid on the on the Squarp. Like yes, it's a keyboard. Like what am I on right now? Like like I can play it, um, but I never do because it's it's one octave. Typically mm -hmm. like it's. It's okay enough for drums, but even drum, the drum brute impact, the way it's programmed, um, the there's two, actually two sets of drums. One is like the super crazy, what do they call it, the colorful drums, and the other one is um, like the regular drums. So like there's two sets and two octaves, and I'd rather just have them all like ready to go, like right on the same keyboard. So. That's typically why I'm, I, I like a keyboard. <laughs> so let me ask you this: right now, you're you're currently doing all of your drum and pitch sequencing in the pyramid. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. How many typically? How many channels of percussion triggers, and how many channels of like uh, pitches and notes? Yeah. So that's a tricky question. But uh, let me change the camera again, and I'll do my best. Um, so the the pyramid has 32 tracks and those are very abstract like there's a lot of abstraction here um and you can make the track whatever you want so you could make 32 tracks that all target the same instrument if you really wanted like the same midi channel um there are uh, there is a set of cv out but i actually am using that for <laughs> clock signal two two clock signals uh, no one's a start stop signal one's a clock signal uh fixed. <laughs> Sorry, I just realized <laughs> I plugged something in the wrong spot in the Cosmo. Um, but the way I have it set up is like, I, I just usually have one track per synthesizer and you can s set it so that when you make a new track, things are just sort of where you want them to be like an init, like a nice initial initialization state. Um, but one of the things I do really like is I actually have two tracks for uh, the drum brute impact. So uh, that allows me to, like, typically the left one I'll do, like, most of the primary drums, bass drum, like the kick drums, those, so those sorts of things. And the other one will be snares, um, typically. But sometimes, like, it's nice to be able to have something running, copy it, paste it in the other one, uh, or, or like, <laughs> do things like uh, I don't think I like, actually the, the whole reason I did this, and I'm having a hard time vocalizing this, is so that when something is playing, I can go to the other track, and while it's muted, program a whole new drum sequence and I do this all the time live um, that I'm just guessing like I can't hear it <laughs> I'm just guessing where things go um, and then when I want to like switch real quick I do that and I just mute one and start the other one and it basically switches to the next pattern um, on that on that second track so that's typically what I do there uh, yeah and I wanted Cosmo to, has I six want, six I wanted tracks. to ask about that interrupt to uh, before we get to the Cosmo because yeah. 
uh, sometimes you change you change patterns and it goes from I, I guess I, I'll just ask the question that when you change to a, to a new pattern, do you change one one of those tracks at a time or do you have a, a preset of all the tracks that you switch to? Like in yeah. other words, do you change all tracks at the same time or do you change them one at a time? Uh, I'll, usually both. Um, there's also <laughs> there's also 64 sequences, uh, wow. which you can think of sequence it like a sequence uh, as a, sort of a mute group for tracks that also like has specific sequences within those tracks. Like each track can have uh, the way I have this set up. Uh, I think 64 different patterns. Mm -hmm. um, so in a sequence, I could say on the drum track I want the second pattern on uh, the X the, the mini log track I want it to be muted micro freak I want it to be playing and then when I go to the next sequence um, I can make it dramatically different so that's typically how I'll do drops and things because it, it can change everything at once uh, that's very um, that's very cool I don't have that capability I do it I do I got to change all four tracks all at the same time I only have four tracks I change them all at the same time and I make use of mutes on my mixer to to make it interesting i mean four tracks is what you need like really that in my opinion that's that's mostly what i'm using it's just i have uh like i don't use all the instruments all the time um i'm typically using four like in this case you can see there's like six things highlighted and that's just four instruments um and i'm not even really i don't think i've even used one of them uh but what i was gonna say is uh i'm doing the same thing like like usually in the climax or where I'm like really feeling it, I, I'll jump into the track and I'm like doing things very manually, which is a lot trickier because I can, can't really like switch different sequences on more than one track at a, at the same exact time. So I have to like really uh, milk it. So like maybe I'll, I'll mute some things, get some uh, hi-hats going, play with the hi-hats while behind the mm -hmm. scenes I'm switching sequences on a, on a couple of tracks and then I'll bring them back in, that kind of stuff. Oh, that's right. Because a lot of times you bring it down to just like a drum beat or one or two voices, and so you're actually changing the other tracks, but they're not yeah. playing, and then right. you're ready to hit them all at the same time. That's smart. Right. That's right. really smart. Right. That's that's my workaround for that, um, and I think that'll translate well to some of the sequencers we were looking at this morning. So. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> This is so complicated. Everything is complicated, but it's really fun. Uh, actually, no, not everything is really fun. I think the wiring part, like plugging, uh, not necessarily that wiring, but like the behind the desk shit to make instruments have sound go to the mixer, that is the worst thing in the world. I hate that. <laughs> and so, Set, setting up a patch bay is among the, the worst activities in the world, in my opinion. It's so detailed. And it's not fun, and you don't get any feedback. Because when you're patching a modular system, you get feedback as soon as you plug in that cable. But right. plugging in a patch bay, you plug in 24 or 48 cables with zero feedback, and they all have to be exactly right. Right, and then you end up with like a sheet of like this to try to mm -hmm. remember where stuff is. And like it's, it's, it's mental gymnastics. Like you actually do have, a, have to do a lot of planning ahead of time uh, to, to get it in a nice state. <laughs> Uh, and, and mine's extra horrible because I, I actually have it sitting uh, right underneath my mixer because it's the same width. Um, but the cables I got are like the exact length to go up about like four inches, wrap around, and then go under to the patch bay, which means I have no flexibility. Like I can't lift up the mixer and like see what's going on. I have to like sort of have it lifted up halfway like the hood of a car and like sort of <laughs> fiddle in there. Um, so yeah, do things better than me is what I'm trying to say. Don't make the same mistakes I did. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do really I do, like the patch bay though. I do not have a patch bay, but that's because I don't have a mixer. It's all it's all in the box. So there's some flexibility. I when we when we got together for the one year anniversary. Yeah. Um, it was interesting. I I I, I thought I had the the ideal solution, but. I have my my output at line level is either two unbalanced uh, 3.5 millimeter cables or one balanced headphone 3.5 millimeter, mm -hmm. and um, turns out that's not the only way that people are outputting audio. I mean, half the people output XLR. Um, there was all kinds of different uh, different things that I I didn't realize that people actually were outputting that. So. 
Yeah. It's oh, you saw that. I, yeah, I wanted to actually ask you about that because you, you were at <laughs> you were at that uh, EMS birthday LA gathering, um, and I'm insanely jealous. <laughs> what was that like? What did you pick up? Like, is that where you saw other people using uh, different audio output types? That's where I saw that. Yeah, and I'll tell you what I picked up is that um, most people have two cases or at least two sets of modular gear. Most people have a big one that they leave at home and a very small one that they bring with them when they travel. Um, and I do not have that. I have one thing that is moderately moderately big. It's not humongous, but it's, yeah. three, it's 9U. Um, I had one of the bigger setups there. Um, not the biggest. I think it was the biggest single case. Cause I, but, I, I mean, like Bartok has two... Se seven U cases. Yeah. So that's actually more, but it's in separated into two cases. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's actually the ideal setup. That that is really really good. Um, Bart Bartok's iterated a lot on cases. So yeah. Yeah, but there there's a lot. Um, I I noticed that I have the ugliest cables by far. <laughs> uh, everybody else has much prettier cables, and everybody else seems to be much more creative. Um. Sometimes I feel like I, I um, everybody's got this really cool vibe, and there's really they're not afraid to 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 explore new realms, and I feel not as creative. <laughs> oh yeah, well I I sort of feel that way too. Uh, every time I watch like any of y'all play, so uh, <laughs> you're not alone. <laughs> Well, whatever I'm like that's okay I'm gonna make like an ambient track now because I'm inspired and I end up with like the same track I wrote yesterday that's like uh, I'm, I'm working on a patch dance core or I, something I'm, I'm working on this patch and I was like dude I'm gonna make a hex 7 patch you just wait this is gonna be great <laughs> I'm gonna totally rip off everything and guess yeah. what it does not sound like something you would make <laughs> <laughs> well you know we all have our own idiosyncrasies that make things sound the way they do um I think that's yeah. a beautiful thing. I remember talking to I – I had a lot of friends that were into filmmaking. And one of the things that we, we kind of realized is you don't need to try to put a reference to your favorite filmmaker in your film. It'll just it'll just come through. Yeah. And it's the same thing. Um, it's kind of a similar vibe with um, when you make a patch, it's always going to sound like your patch. <laughs> so. <laughs> Just That's... like feel free to try to imitate whoever you want and duplicate whatever you want. It's not going to sound like that. It's going to sound like your patch, and that's fine. Yeah, I mean, there's there's things that like yes, I have a blank slate patch here, but you know for sure I'm going to do the same bass voice I always do because I can't get enough of it. Like what you don't see when I'm streaming is me just like turning on the bass and like giggling and like playing with the cutoff <laughs> and like that's all I'm doing. <laughs> Like, I love those things. So, um, yeah, I end up with some of the same voices just because, just for that reason. Like, they just make me, they're really satisfying sounds uh, to me. Um, but, uh, yeah, to that to the point of a travel case, um, I was eyeing something. I think what I'm going to do first before I worry about travel or any of that is I'm going to make a Euro rack case. So I ordered a big power supply because uh, I don't want to die and I'm... <laughs> I'm still going to try the other one, but like that one's going to take more work and I don't have the energy for that right this second. So I'm going to build the case. It's going to be the size of this case here. So like uh, that, but three or three rows. So 9U, 157 HP or something like that. That's a uh, pretty wide. big Euro rat case. That's, that's pretty huge. Yeah, so it'll be massive. Um, <laughs> like the power supply I got is for like those giant cases. So um, it should be fine. Should be fine. Uh, and uh, so I'm excited about that. But I think one of the follow-ups I'd like to do is make like a lunchbox, like straight up uh, either make my own uh, lunchbox size case <laughs> or like, I don't know, 2 HP has a cool one too, but I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather just find one. Like, well, you could, uh, also, yeah. you could also find like a plastic, like a like an actual lunchbox that like actually has like a, like a Ghostbusters logo well, on it. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like I want to go pawn yeah. shopping to find, like it may uh, not be a lunchbox, but like find a thing to put some modules in. <laughs> like just slap slap a, a FC UK power supply in there, one adapter, easy peasy, and uh, make, it to, make it to go case, you know? That's good times. Um, 
because it is it is uh, one of the one of the nice things about uh, your rock I will say is that yeah. all of the modules I've gotten have the holes in the same spots right like <laughs> <laughs> and that sounds trivial but when you've got like wooden rails or even metal rails like having the holes in the right spots is a big deal so um, I can't re I didn't really do that with Cosmo especially at the beginning like uh, like these holes are further down than these holes. They're different. Than, they're all a little bit different. So, um, and you for your Cosmo mm -hmm. modules, you literally screw them into the wood directly. Yes. So, so when you rearrange them, it's it's like unscrew it out of the wood and then rescrew it back into the wood. There are some uh, challenges to that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think if I did like an extreme rearrange because of the way I mounted these rails, I glued them on because I'm. I'm using very old warped wood and I didn't like use a planer or anything to straighten it out or anything. So, uh, I glued it to keep it all square. Um, <laughs> uh, but that means that wood's there un un unless I feel like somehow cutting it out, um, and breaking like wood glue is very strong, <laughs> um, probably stronger than the wood I use. So, um, I have to fill it in the holes and then re maybe redrill some holes if I need to slide things over. Like a the worst is like, an eighth of an inch hmm. um, or even less like because the screws want to slide into the hole anyway that's that's the challenge with Cosmo modules there um, but usually things lined up like I did rearrange one of these pretty significantly and, and things like pretty magically lined up well for the most part uh, there's a couple modules that I think like this one that like <laughs> are being squeezed pretty good from the side so uh, <laughs> Uh, it's okay. <laughs> I did a big rearrange my of my case, and um, it's basically the third or fourth time I've I've massively rearranged things without the modules themselves haven't changed much, but I've just gradually been refining the the layout. And this time I got the layout in a in a way, and I I started patching, and I I'm finding that I all. I very rarely need the long cables. All I ever need are the the, the tiniest uh, three inch and six inch cables, which is amazing. That that that's great, and that's I mean I just I just ordered a bunch of cables from Bartok, but um, t typically that's how my stuff works too. Like there's a reason like. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but the majority of my cables are <laughs> are the Cosmo equivalent of short cables. So they're like a foot, uh, and then I have a bunch of like six inch ish cables, which when you have quarter inch jacks is like mostly jack. Um, and my layout is pretty efficient at this point, so I don't I don't need the huge cables most of the time. Uh, hey, Alex, hey, how's it going? Hey, Alex. Hey, hey, a uh, Forestine mentioned turning the thermos the thermos for the lunchbox into a little speaker, but I wanted to mention that um, that um, Star Girl, um, what's the the, the uh, what's her company name? Winter Makes, Bloom. Winter Bloom made a made a module that is a speaker. Yes. Uh, and it's like an interesting speaker module, and I think that might be a cool thing to put in the lunchbox directly. I agree, and it's like you know, it's. Um... Like, if you're talking audiophile, it's like a crappy speaker, right? But sure. that's my kind of speaker. Like, it's probably a piezo or something, but the module is beautiful. Uh, I, I basically want everything winter bloom because I, th I think it's amazing. Um, so I'll probably <laughs> – there's definitely going to be some winter bloom in the, in the new case. But uh, what I was going to say is that, that thermos is a pretty rad idea, but, like, I don't want to make it a speaker, although that's cool. I mean, I guess I could do both because it's pretty much the same wiring, but I want to make it a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> right? Or maybe the, maybe the lid's the microphone, right? Yeah. And you and, and the, it's big the enough. The other you thing is the speaker. Put a big battery in there too, I guess. Yeah. I, or I don't know. I guess you probably have power. Well, maybe it could be your portable power source too. I, yeah, I don't know. There's don't a lot know. of options there. Yeah. Uh, so that uh, foresting is a brilliant idea. Um <laughs> Yeah, uh, even more stoked on a lunchbox idea now. Um, yep. because, yeah, <laughs> I'm clearly no phone to like uh, speakers in weird places. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. back to the cables. Like, I, I, I actually really, 
I, th I think I spend a lot of time thinking about it when I'm playing and well, not when I'm playing live, but like when I'm like just messing around. Um, and when I'm like doing other stuff, cause like, I think, um, the way you sort of lay out your instrument is really important. Um, like Colin Bender spent a lot of time thinking about like, how do I make it so like these 27 patch points don't have to go across the system. So he made some like teleports and things like that. So, um, my, my following suit, I guess. Man, Bandit Lou too. Hey, everybody. No, everybody's coming in. That's that's beautiful. Is it like? Is it because it's winter? Everybody's like in earlier. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I, well, I, it's winter here. I don't. It's probably fall still where y'all are at. <laughs> or in LA, it's always uh, like a spring. Yeah, I mean, we have all four seasons, but we distribute them geographically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you can go to the winter in the mountains, yeah. but then you come back to like where normal people yeah. live. <laughs> yeah. Um, for those of you who haven't seen, Colin Benders did some really, uh, really good videos on how he th he thought about laying out this massive system as it, like he completely re rebuilt it. Um, and I, I don't think there's a better better way to familiarize or at least understand some of the concepts that, that he thinks about. Um, and and that's, <laughs> I think we, we have talked about this before, but we all have similar ways. Like I have like my drum section and I have my like bass section and you know, you kind of have your sections, but yeah, you can mix and match when you want to get weird. You can have your sections, but there's some things that you don't want sections of like, like VCAs, you don't want them all in one corner. Yeah, utilities got to spread out. Like I've yeah. got, um, I especially love my buffers. Like I got buffer molts here, here. I've got envelopes here, here, up there. Uh, just one door stopper. Um, let's see. Like I mean, oscillators everywhere, LFOs everywhere. Like you got to spread things out that are very, very useful. So I just, um, I just made an order, and I just got a bunch. I, I, re I recognize that I don't have enough. Um, ways to malt things so i got several i got a couple different options because i don't know the best way so i got this 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 cable which is i think it's called a hopscotch cable yep um well get that in in frame and i got like i got several of these so i'm going to try patching with these where you can take take a signal and go somewhere else but it also you can plug in another cable so i got some of those and then i got a bunch of these, which are the standard stackable uh, cables, which I think these are my preferred way because then you, when you plug this in, you actually have one, two additional points to patch from. Um, whereas with this cable, you only have a, a single additional point. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't even ventured into the realm of, like, like it's not even an option I've had um, because I haven't needed it for my tiny uh, 64 HP Euro rack. Um, and uh, I have a lot of buffered malts, so that's that's how I handle it. But uh, I do think that I do just looking at the like watching other people using the hopscotch one is the one that makes the most sense to me because I'm like a klutz. And <laughs> when you stack, I mean, it's just like here, like if you uh, can I even stack that? Let's see, I'm sure I can. Like when you stack two jacks, right, like this. Now it's mm -hmm. like essentially twice as long, which means more leverage happening on the oh. socket if you if you whack it. Um, so that's something that, while I haven't experienced, is is like always worry worrying to me. Um. <laughs> it might be less. It might be less of an issue with uh, maybe in so. your rack because they're tiny, but they are much smaller, and the cables. Uh, the yeah, the cable to jack ratio is is pretty. It should be fine. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, Alex, what's a door stopper? You know, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Uh, yeah, let's zoom in real quick as much as I can. But uh, yeah. I have a I have an ears module um, way down low that uh, I've bolted a, a door stopper right on the other side of the piezo, and it is the best CV. A manipulator thing. I enjoy the crap out of it, particularly for like really garbling samples. Uh, so that's that's what door stuff. I was gonna is. say you don't really you don't really use that for audio. You use it to get weird CV values. 
yeah, I'm primarily using it for CV. And the, another cool thing that I, I like to do sometimes is I'll I'll take the uh, I'll, I'll take it in, I'll put the signal straight into my base uh, filter, um, mm -hmm. and you can like <laughs> grab it and like pull it right. Like just do this, and you get like the wubbiest wub sound. Like it's super <laughs> cool. So. Yeah, I've been uh, I've been experimenting with audio rate, just putting audio, uh, any waveform, audio into filter CV, and you in, it's like instant grungy awesomeness. So yeah. I can imagine that could be really good for that. Yeah, and when, when I'm doing laundry, that's why there's still a jack uh, taped to the side of it. Is is um, it just adds some a little bit of dirt to whatever you you pipe it into. It's nice. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, actually the dryer is louder, so I use a dryer, but, uh, you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I'm, in my opinion, get a shitload of piezos and strap them to everything that makes sound in your room and you'll be a happy camper with modular. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden those things that used to annoy you, you're like, yes, the heater's on, let's send that CV in. Uh, like, <laughs> it's the best. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of what else I'd do. I mean, the door stopper is just super fun. Like, I, I usually, like, if I'm using the ramp a lot, like, especially with vocal sound, like the Furbies, you've heard me do it a bunch of times with Furbies, um, is this will mangle the pitch, which sounds super glitchy and cool. And then this I will have, this other ears, um, I will set up to trigger the freeze. So it'll uh, essentially stutter whatever it is. Oh, right. Very it's cool. really good for, um, like, the, the Amen break stuttering that is pretty rad yeah the last time you did a patch and you used the amen break there was some really cool you were okay let me ask you this this is about your last patch so for i hope that everybody watching remembers the last stream you did well yeah. recently um yeah. you were doing some it, it looked like you were doing manual triggering of of slices of the amen break is that what you were doing Pseudo manual, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I was sort of programming it in uh, while we were listening to it, but yeah, I was I was messing messing with that a lot um, and picking the particular slice. Although for whatever reason, the fourth slice decided to stop working all of a sudden. So, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> Do it live. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, the amen break is. Uh, well, I was just gonna make the sound, but oh man, not, I, I, I'll I'll say some words about it. It's from this song. This uh, I think it's called "Amen," and it's from the '60s. And um, it's like there's this drum beat that the drummer plays, and it's super. It's like super well known um, thing. It, it's from the 1960s, I think. Anyways, this drum beat it has been sampled by like every hip hop person ever. It's it's that drum beat that you're listening to. It's the most sampled drum beat ever. And people slice it up and replay it and and modify it, but it's like it's like the most sampled drum beat of them all. And for a good reason cuz it's it's freaking awesome. Like the the drummer is is playing this amazing drum drum solo. It's the best. Like the, you can't like the snare, like everything in it sounds so good. See that last last one gives up sometimes. Uh, I hope my SD card isn't failing, <laughs> but I have it backed up. It's fine. Yeah, there's um, yeah. A Alex says there's literally documentaries on YouTube, and it's like yeah, yeah, because it's that important. It's been it's been sampled. It's that it's it's insane. It's like it's almost like its own. It's it's kind of like the um, the audio the music equivalent of. Uh, the Wilhelm scream in movies. <laughs> if yep. you've ever, if you know what that yep. is, yep. that one scream that you always hear in every movie. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and that's. I mean, it's it's everywhere. Like if you, <laughs> you'll start recognizing it, especially a lot of like rave music, all sorts of hip hop, like <laughs> everywhere. Um, it's a sick. It's a sick sample. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, like Alex said, there's documentaries about it. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I'm not gonna walk over there. <laughs> uh, it's one of my favorites to use. I I try not to use it all the time because I mean, yeah, 
it's repetitive to me. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of other good samples on there. I think one of the things I'm going to start doing uh, with with this next patch that I do um, is actually pick like a nice sample pack from it uh, that I haven't used. Like there's a lot of like more mu melodic stuff in there that that aren't amen breaks or drums. So do find something weird and manipulate the crap out of it, and then add some other instruments and have have a blast. So that's that's what I want to do. I, you know, that's actually why I got my sampler is, is yeah, I wanted to explore samples, but also because I got this, um, I kickstarted this, this project called the Oxy One. It's this big controller. It's like a big array of buttons. It kind of looks like a deluge, but, yeah. um, but it's has way more CV out. Um, but it also can, do, has MIDI out and it can do chords and bass and this whole thing. Yeah, and I, I I don't I don't have a way to do like polyphony in a single module with my setup, so I got the the uh, Bitbox Micro because it can take in MIDI and do polyphony. So if and when that thing ever is delivered, because I think I kickstarted it before the global chip shortage was a thing, so hopefully they're able to deliver on time. I'm sh yeah, I'm straight up waiting on like uh, f three to five like music related things. Um, <laughs> that I ordered in like 2019, <laughs> which yeah. is fine. Like I'm not, it sucks to be those companies just as much as it sucks to be us waiting. Like <laughs> uh, probably worse for them because they get all the hate, hate mail and stuff. But um, yeah, so I, I mean, that's a cool, that's a cool, uh, I'm, I'm surprised at you getting a controller that's separate from a modular, which is kind of <laughs> cool. Uh, but I do remember seeing it, it was pretty rad. Uh, but the, <laughs> Sampling, man, I, I just, there's a lot of workflow I just don't enjoy around it. Like I enjoy manipulating the samples. Like I really enjoy manipulating the samples, especially like the Korg uh, Volca sample is sick. Like it's awesome to play with. The controls are really fun. It's fun to just like, you can do it by itself, like and be happy all day. But putting a sample on there is like nightmarish, <laughs> like trying to bring things consistent. Like it's just, I didn't enjoy that at all. Um, whereas the Rample came with like <laughs> a stacked SD card, like they got a bunch of really cool people that made really cool sample packs. Um, and, and that's how I want, I just want someone to make SD cards full of random groups of samples <laughs> and I will buy that. I don't want to, I don't want to like subscribe to something and have to like, I don't enjoy that. Like it's, it's like, like. I do design work for my day job and so like if you're if you've ever done design like one of the like if someone's like hey make a logo like one of the first things you do is like other than some concepting is you're like okay well there needs to be a typeface usually a, a logo mark that has I mean not just the logo mark but the the, the 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 logo type the actual text of a name so you start looking for typefaces and you might scroll through like 6,000 of them or some horrible number right that's how I feel about samples, but way slower because you actually have to listen to it. Like, like I can skim like 27 typefaces in a fraction of a second. Uh, I have to listen to a sample to know if I like it or not. Uh, so I don't, I don't really, I don't ever want to like dig through a sample library to find the things I like because it would just take ages and I wouldn't be that satisfied at the end of it. I just want someone to make a cool SD card that I can buy and plug into the Rample. That's or whatever device. That's the same kind of reasoning is why I liked the, the Bitbox Micro, even though I took it out of my case like an idiot. Um, but I like it because I don't, I don't do anything special to get my, I, to record onto the SD card, but I, I can do it in my case. And in fact, I did do it in my case. I plug it in, I record it, and I can trim the beginning and trim the ending all on the yeah. module, in yeah. the case. There's no, the workflow is like, patch your module, patch your modular, okay, go okay it's, <laughs> it's on there and that's what i wanted i didn't want to have to i didn't want to have to like use basically i didn't want to have i didn't want to be forced into using a computer to record it into a daw and then export it in this whole workflow thing and that's the thing i've had to do with like adding my own samples and things to the to the rample which i don't love i mean drop it into like we got some conversion programs that make it slightly faster but you still need to like trim it uh you can do it in the ramp and actually save those settings um but it's mm -hmm. it's like you already have to do things on the computer so you might as well just trim it there 
Um, <laughs> like I, I don't like that workflow. Um, I did sort of like the sampling workflow with the morphogene. It was similar to what you said. You pipe things into it, doesn't matter. Um, record the thing, stop, go, chop it up, have fun. Um, and that works pretty well. But the thing that I just never jived with is like, <laughs> if I pipe in like my cool a lead sound or something like then I just have like a chopped up version of a lead sound and then when I play my lead sound they just sort of mix and get muddy and I don't like it <laughs> yeah. uh, so <laughs> it's just not good yeah. at it is the problem um, I was never like happy just letting the morphogene be the center of attention um, and it deserves it yeah that's hard you know it's funny you mentioned the, an interesting thing like on in visual art in visual art you can you're it you're, you're as a viewer you're able to as a consumer you're able to consume it uh however you want because like like i'm imagining a, like you like you said typeface but i'm imagining a painting yeah but like if there's a painting on a wall the the artist can't force me to look in the upper left corner for any right. amount of time right like i choose what i look at when i'm looking at the painting yeah. But but with this with with music and with the synthesizer and with with samples and whatever, there's this element of time, and because I control it, it has to unfold over time. I can force you to listen to something for a certain amount of time. So there's kind of a there's kind of some control there, and I kind of like that. <laughs> I just popped there's in. Some, I mean, I tend to do a lot of like. Uh, well, my whole track is like eight bass lines, right? <laughs> I notice you have a lot. Of, a lot of times you have two or three bass lines. Yeah. At, at the same time. Yeah, uh, I like the way they play together, and usually there's enough variance in the voice uh, that I, I, I don't know. I just like the sound of it. Um, but when I listen back, like I, when, you know, me playing live, I'm like, yeah, this is what people are paying attention to. I'm controlling this, and then I listen back, and I'm like, oh, that didn't come through. Like <laughs> this other thing is what. <laughs> it's still good but it's like the other thing's still take, taking my attention which is kind of cool um so like yeah some there's some truth to that and like another thing i find myself doing uh is like trying to figure out uh without like four to the floor um m nice methods that tell people like give them some affordance of when a sequence is starting and ending uh not necessarily when i'm stopping and playing it but like when it's repeating right um, there's that point because it's really jarring to me if I've got like a drum sequence going, which happens to me all the time when I'm messing around, just like slamming buttons together, um, where I lose where the beginning of it is. <laughs> like, like all of a sudden, like mentally, when I sh it shifts, like the what I'm hearing as the beginning of it is like three quarters of the way through the sequence, uh, and if I like change at the end of that sequence, it's really jarring for me. I've uh, had that. But, I've had that before also. Yeah, where you, you because it's playing back on a loop your ear starts to think that three quarters of the way through it is the beginning. And then when you right. switch a sequence, it's, it's like changes at a weird time and you're like, Oh, I didn't expect that. Right. Yeah. Uh, Forestine and affordance is typically, uh, it's not talked about in music, but <laughs> it's a design thing, but it's, it's something that gives the user or listener uh, some clue as to what's going to happen. Uh, in this case, like if I've got like a baseline going, uh, I can do a few things like I might uh, s at three quarters of the way through a 16 um, note sequence. I might uh, stop playing notes. Uh, so that's like the first eight notes and then it's just silent. And that, that, that gives you a pretty clear idea that it's going to restart again, like where the beginning and the end is. Um, or you can like put a high note towards the end is another good one or a really high note right at the beginning or something like there's, there's a bunch of different ways that you may unintentionally, but like that's, that's how I think about it a little bit. I have to, I have to force myself to do that a lot because, uh, it, it, you know, it, in my mind, I, I, I listen to a lot of reggae music and one of the, one of the, the characteristics of reggae music commonly is that you have melodies that go over the bar line. And that is to say they, you know, maybe they start on the third beat of the last measure and then loop around into the first measure. So that makes it even worse when you're doing it, doing, doing yeah. a melody on a modular thing, because now you're, you're in, you're, you're the actual start of your melody is three beats before the first beat. <laughs> yes. Yes. And that, 
that puts me in a weird situation, especially live where I'm like, all right, how do I like work out of this hole? <laughs> like, I can't like sync everything up. That'll be super jarring. Uh, like sometimes like you cut out the melody voice or something and like resync it, but like, I don't know. Um, I feel that. And yeah, Alex points out like the D like when DJs apply that high pass filter that just goes higher and higher and higher and higher. And higher. <laughs> Boom. You know a drop is going to come. Yeah. Uh, exactly when a drop <laughs> is going to come. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's another really good one. Um, a good example of like an affordance to, to let folks know what's going on. Uh, and and like, <laughs> Forrest is like, well, I give anyone a clue. Um, you know what? If you're listening to me live, I surprise people plenty, including myself. Like, I, uh, the worst is when I do, you know, my version of a high pass filter before a drop, right? Like I'm ready to go for a drop. And then like, I hit the drop like a half a second too early. So the sequence starts playing like too early or like I come in like three quarters of the way through a melody or something crappy like that. Like those are surprises to me as well as to everyone else probably. <laughs> so there's plenty of surprises, um, which is fine. Uh, also, I uh, volume levels, uh, or <laughs> there's something that I surprise myself with a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, like, like really, like sometimes what I'll do is like, I'll cut this voice out, right? Like a lead and I'll dramatically change the filter, like crank the resonance and the filter. And I don't know where it's at. Like you kind of have to listen to it, but like, I'm like guessing and like, I'm like, you know what? This would be cool with distortion on too. <laughs> And then when that comes in, I'm like, oh, shit, turn away now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Thankfully, uh, you, you, I mean, I get it blasted through my headphones real loud, but, like, I think the clipping handles it for y'all a little bit better than that. Um. <laughs> oh, Alex brought up a good, I mean, that's an awesome technique right there. He says that what you can do is you can apply the high pass filter. So gradually turn up the high pass filter on the drums only, right? So you start losing the kick right away, but some of the snare remains and then it becomes basically hi hat only, right? Then you yeah. fade out the bass line and then you bring everything back and add in the new bass line and it just it just it's an awesome transition, awesome it's an awesome milestone uh, for, for the music. That's that's an awesome technique. That's actually something I'm going to play with. Well, not that specific, but what I was going to play with was actually running uh, drums through the Ikari because that's my only real uh, modular high-pass filter. Um, just to try stuff like that. I don't, I don't know how well it plays with drums yet because I haven't tried it, so I'm sure it's going to be uh, the friendliest drums ever. One of the things um, you've got to do, though, in order to do that is you do have to, assuming that you're using different modules to make drum sounds, yeah. you, you have to sub-mix them, right? You have to put them all into one mix and then put that one mix through the through the the filter right so i don't actually have a shortage of mixers that's something i'm okay with because i have a, a a good um four channel vca mixer here here and then just a six channel uh mixer up here and then the uh ground control which is uh you know it could be up to eight or well four stereo channels or you know you can convert them to mono but um yeah so i would probably sub mix them up there because that one's i hardly ever use for anything so um not a not a huge problem uh but yeah uh because i do want to run this through it because i do use ramp up primarily for percussion uh and definitely the the drum brute which actually uh if they had included a high pass filter on the drum brute that would have been sick or that would have been filter really cool. <laughs> well does, isn't there one that has a filter I thought uh, the um, but not the impact. The regular drum brute has a low pass filter. I thought it might, but honestly, I just was not stoked in, about the in, sounds in, on there. Instead of the because because the drum brute impact has like a drive, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can also do mixing in other ways. Like I've done plenty of like <laughs> bodgy mixes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> bodgy mixes. I like yeah. that. I like uh, that. Like. Um, running two channels into this uh, GUR filter, which isn't, calling it a filter is weird, but um, like that kind of mixing where it's, <laughs> it doesn't sound the best if you're looking for a clean mix, but it does work. Um, let's see what else. Forestine's still yeah. still freaking out about the um, the affordances. And I think it's, this talks to a deeper philosophical 
approach to to what music is because um, at a fundamental level, music is about um, balancing um, satisfaction of expectations and defying expectations. And that balance is is entirely up to the the composer, right? It's up to you to decide how many how many expectations you want to satisfy and how many expectations you want to defy. Um, and I, I think if if you go in either direction too far, I think you end up with a, with something that is not enjoyable in any deep way. Right, like jazz music. Um... It's not enjoyable in any way. <laughs> I'm just uh, I mean, I mean, you could make the argument like, like on like, okay, I'm I'm generalizing here, but like on one end of the spectrum is like the worst, crappiest, generic pop song that has yeah. nothing interesting in it. It's completely predictable. It's completely boring. And you hate it because it's like, all it does is set up your expectations and then completely satisfy them in boring, mundane ways. Yeah. But on the other end of the spectrum, you've got like, maybe I'm, I'm just going to pick pick on this. I'm going to call it free jazz. Um, even even free jazz isn't the best example, but just imagine that's sure. a good, it's, it's I got to point to something. And it's it's really difficult to enjoy because you don't have any framework so it kind of it it just kind of happens and you go well there was a lot of sounds in there and wow that guy sure is is technically good at his instrument <laughs> but you're like you don't really enjoy it that's that's how i uh i was there was some truth to my con like that's how i feel about like some experimental jazz and things but uh there is jazz that i really like but there's there's some that I just can't listen to because it, it is completely uh, chaotic and I need my like predictable pop chorus or something. Uh, and, and like <laughs> to your point, like a boring pop song, like even a really good pop song, like there's, you know, there's, a, there's always a pop song that everybody likes that you're like, okay, that's pretty good. They did a good well, job. They're good. It's surprising they, in some way. They're good because they have some element where they defy your expectations in yes. a new and exciting way. And you're like, yes. I like that. Yeah. Yes, but when you listen to it 20 times, all of a sudden that, that track's like not usually as good as the first time you listen to it because you know everything is going to happen. That's right. That's right. Uh, it's why, like, if I'm working, I try to listen to music I've listened to before <laughs> or, like, really mellow stuff. Um, because if I listen to new stuff, I'm paying too much attention to the music. Like, it's, it's too much uh, in my focus, I guess. Here, here's another good example that... Um... That I that I've heard, um, a lot of people are familiar with this song that goes like this, "Baby Shark, do 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 do, Baby Shark, do do do." Have you heard that song? This is actually the first time I've heard it, like no okay. joke. But I've seen it like written out like a million times on the internet. Like I've just never heard the song because uh, okay. I'm not kids. But, but that's quite literally how how the song goes, right? <laughs> like there's nothing to it. Now, to anybody over the age of about ten, it it's it's annoying because it's so predictable and it's so basic and it's it sets up these expect strong expectations and then completely satisfies them in completely predictable ways but fascinatingly little kids love this song and there's there's a reason for it and that's because to them they're still developing a sense of of musical expectations and musical satisfaction and it's it's just it's just barely predictable enough that they can actually enjoy it and they can actually listen to it and it's not just it's not just a c cacophony of completely unexpected noises all the time right. and so for them it's like this ideal song so it's like a fascinating it's a fascinating thing that it's it's actually annoying to us and li <laughs> little kids love it I, I actually really do love it um, because of all the memes I've seen but I, 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 mean, I really haven't heard <laughs> until today <laughs> I mean, my head I mean, was a little yeah. different um <laughs> I mean, you, you can look it up, and it might get stuck yeah. in your head because it's so simple and so basic. And I, and I don't hate it either. I purposely avoided but... that because when <laughs> things get stuck in my head, like they're there for a while. <laughs> uh, which you know, uh, and, and yeah, like Nubulon, uh I don't know. I don't need structure. I just enjoy structure. There's a difference, I think. Um, <laughs> like, not structure and everything. Like, I think there's 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 a good amount of there's a good balance of chaos and structure that I like to achieve. <laughs> and, uh, like, I don't love total randomness, even if it's, like, you know, 
you've got some quantizer going that keeps it within a specific range of notes and a specific uh, uh, I can't even remember. Yeah. Scale. A specific scale, a specific range of notes. Like, even then, like, I still don't love chaos. Like, I like things to repeat at least a good amount of time. So I like a little bit of chaos here and, and enough structure for me to, like, nod my head to it. Uh, the worst for me is when drums are, like, on full on random where they, like, you might have programmed in a pattern, but uh, on the pattern on each drum you said, like, full randomness, so a note may or may not play. And like when that one kick that you really need cuts out, you're like, Ugh, like it's a shot. <laughs> like I feel physically like someone just hurt me on, the, on those bits. Uh, and so that I don't I don't tend to put too much randomness on drums. But like if we're talking the lesser um, the 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 percussion that really plays well with chaos, like. Uh, you've got hats. like I don't know, 16 notes hats is exactly what I was going to say if those are cutting in and out I don't care it's still awesome like sometimes it's really magical when they do that so <laughs> yeah whenever you make yeah. a mistake repeat it yeah, <laughs> yeah yep. good point yep. yeah then it's then it's no longer a mistake it's you you did that on purpose mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, luckily with our secret thinking outside the box yeah <laughs> Luckily, with our sequencers, we have to repeat it because they're just gonna they're gonna play until you stop them. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you make a mistake, um, uh, yeah. So, uh, you, you covered a lot of good stuff today. Jeez, Baby Shark too. Um, I know, man. I, I saying Baby Shark. I apologize to anybody I triggered with that because that's some people genuinely get upset about it, and I think it's because they have kids that love it and listen to it. And they're sick to death of it. It's kind of like the um, there's a song that Disney did called "Let It Go," from a movie called Frozen. And I don't think I've ever heard it all the way through, but I'm aware that people are sick of it, and they they hate it now because there's no more defiance of expectations because it's completely predictable for them. And you just hurt Tim by even mentioning that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Forestine, yeah. So your your comment, like following structures of songs for your own enjoyment versus something in your structure to signal something to the audience. Good topic. I see what Good you're topic. saying. Um, I, when I'm streaming, I am thinking about the audience as 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 much as myself. But like when I'm talking about affordances, it also helps me. So like if I if I make a drum pattern that feels like it starts in the middle, like I'm gonna change that because it. <laughs> or I will lose track of where the beginning of that is and I will hit go on like the next sequence halfway through a track or something like I'll start doing things like that. So it's, it's both for me and for the audience. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm the, I'm a, I'm the same way. There's no, there's no distinction between what's for me and what's for the audience, because I, I will say that I, I try to make a patch that I love um, and I, I just hope that that's what people will like, but I definitely, there's no, I'm thinking about how it will be perceived, yeah. of course, but that's because I'm thinking about how the patch is going to sound and that's, I'm listening to it at the same time that the audience is. So I just try to make something I love. Yeah. And that's, that's the way I go to, um, like the, you typically see me like hit the stream button when I'm like really amped on something like hey, I made something cool and I feel good about this and I want to share it. Like, let's go. Um, and I'm always surprised at what people like <laughs> every time. Like, sometimes I'm like, oh, yeah, that people actually did like that. But most of the time I'm like, eh, lukewarm, cool. <laughs> I really liked it. It was fun. I'll play it again for myself. Um, and affordance is the word that's like a typical, like, web designer term not necessarily i don't think music people use it <laughs> like when you're designing designing something for like several million people you gotta like think about how they're gonna use it and give them some hints as to how to use a thing yeah i would not use affordance to describe music but there are certain <laughs> there are certain things there are ways to set up expectations and some and interestingly some of those some of those ways to set up expectations are um, universal in that they're based purely on physical phenomenon and some of them are cultural and they're based purely on things we've learned 
to expect. And I, I think that's inter- that's fascinating. But that's a whole nother. We could go on another whole. That's a whole nother topic. That's a whole nother. Yeah. Uh, like I'm fired up. I could keep going for like an hour, but I think I should stop. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> I think we should stop uh, and continue this the next time. Uh, you're around at this time or even if you come in halfway that's fine too yeah this Um, was really fun i really appreciate you having me on i love this show i love uh, ems man i love modular synthesizers uh great audience tonight um everybody's saying cool cool things in the chat yeah like all of the comments are head scratch like not necessarily head scratchers but they get me thinking about things differently a little bit like, <laughs> audience yeah, hard drum patterns quickly bored right like swung swung rhythms and things like that quickly quickly add some interest or even like the reason i love these analog drums so much even though some of their sounds are like janky as heck uh is that i can very quickly completely change the feel of it like make it less boring like i can way open up the decay on this the the snare or something and all of a sudden it's like silent because i muted it but (laughs) Uh, (laughs) like it it has a different feel than like and that's like my equivalent of the high pass filter is opening that up every once in a while but like yeah that's that's the hey that's the number one reason uh why i'm if if there's one reason why i'm happy i got rid of my sampler and put back in other modules is now i can tweak the sound live beyond just pitch and filter i can actually change the sound because i'm synthesizing it live i love that right and the rample is one that i don't like i can change like what pitch bit crushing filter freeze like those are all really cool effects right but the way you do it is like i hit the freeze button and then now all the all of these knobs control the freeze on each track so i have to like oh you z- can't really do it with cv I can do it with CV, so that's primarily why I oh. do it with CV. <laughs> okay. Uh, instead of like just reaching over and cranking up the decay or something, you know. Yep. Yep. Yeah, uh, I can reach over and crank the crank the wave folder on my on my my Basimilis Ateritas, and suddenly it gets more awesome. <laughs> yeah, that thing clearly is going to make it into my my next rack because um, <laughs> I such... I very much enjoyed it. Like I think I'm going to do different things than you with it, but. Uh, I learned a lot playing with it. The what, <laughs> what the two nights <laughs> in the hallway. <laughs> I wish we had gotten together uh, during the day and actually just sat down and kind of hung out, and you had a chance to poke around on the rack. That would have been really cool. But... I was actually quite tipsy that one day, uh, middle of the day. So I'm <laughs> sort of glad we didn't. Uh, a competition required drinking. Um, <laughs> it was a soldering thing. Um, Let's see. <laughs> uh, let's see. Actually, I think about Hex Music. Let me find it. Yeah. I mean, I think music, like most art, uh, unless you're like uh, the the folks that architect the next pop artist that makes it big, like for the most part, music is fair, fairly intrinsic. Like you're sort of making it for yourself to have a good time. Um, and yeah, you're thinking about the audience a little bit too, but... Yeah. When is the next stream train? That's a good question. Um, I'm probably game to do a caboose sometime this weekend, but I don't know what day because I think I've got to go to a training on Saturday or Sunday. So I'll figure that out once I get a date lined up. But I would do a carriage, uh, and we can extend it into a train uh, if any of y'all are interested. Yeah, I could probably do uh, one something this weekend. One day. Um, yeah. I just need like good. a rough time area, and I, you know. But uh, I don't know about <laughs> official good. stream train. I think I think usually it takes about a month or so for folks, especially after the birthday one, to to want to organize another. another so one, massive. So. That was so massive, but I amazingly, it it went really well. Like oh, it was Sunday's it, Halloween. Shoot. Oh, I totally bl- blanked on that. I I'm not going anywhere, so yeah, maybe I'll. S- you know, play some spooky stuff for y'all. Yeah, we got used to not going out. Maybe maybe there's a Sunday stream train. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah, I don't even... Like, I'll dress as, like... I'll dress as Robbie. Shave <laughs> my face. Put on a flannel shirt. Good to go. 
<laughs> it has to be a button down. Yeah. I always get button down oh, collars. That's I do thing. have a button. I do have a button yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. I like the high collared continental kind of. Yeah, let's, shirt. yeah. Let's Halloween. Uh, let's let's <laughs> scream train on on Sunday. Um, hell yeah. Uh, ooh. <laughs> I can't even make the sounds I want to make because there's no wires in there yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. Um, Robbie, you want to play us out with some uh, Baby Shark? <laughs> baby Shark. <laughs> all right. All right. Let's play here. Let's turn your... <laughs> Please, I don't got my audio hooked up, man. Let's, see. let's hear it. You had such a fun little patch. There it is. Yeah, what I did was I sort of like, I totally like killed the pitch, but like, let me change the camera angle. This thing is just so much fun. Like it's it's essentially a, uh, it's a low frequency oscillator. That's essentially the clock speed of VCO and another uh, high frequency oscillator that sort of play together like almost uh, like an FM sort of effect. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, see, that's totally like an FM kind of weirdness. But there's no filter. And then down here is uh, the essentially a clock divider or multiplier. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it's a multiplier. It, well, data divider bits, whatever. Um, so this, this allows me to like change the pitches and stuff on a sequence so I can do all sorts of cool things and mix things around. So it's really nice. I wish I had a little filter, but uh, it, it's great for what it is because you can get some really cool stuff. And what I was doing was, um, so I've got like a this sort of sequence going, right? Mm -hmm. And then if I hit, uh, let's go to where I'm not playing anything. If I hit play, now the clock is syncing. You can hear it kind of messing up. Yeah. Right, so you sort of find a sweet spot. Like, it right? Creates you almost like have like some swing, yeah. Yeah. right? That sometimes breaks and sometimes doesn't. And then you just, you know. Clearly, I need to do a little pitch matching, but that's what I did. So um, that's 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 it. And then, like you know, I just plopped in some. Uh, uh, did I mute? What's going on here? Why are you making noise? Where does he get these Make wonderful toys? There we yeah, go. Yeah, this. That one's also synced with the clock, but it's actually synced with this one's clock, so it's also slightly broken. Good night, y'all. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. What a what a fun night.